Hello again. This is my second video in the series on value forms and it's the first time I've attempted to use the OBS system. So I'm going to see whether I get a better quality recording using OBS. In this video I'm going to be talking about the physics of the value form and discuss why value form has the shape that it had that I described before. How this compares to the space that you get in quantum or optical systems, how it relates to energy conservation, um, how it establishes that value must be a scalar field and talk about how labour selects from the infinity of such fields. Now why is value space not Euclidean? This is something I noticed way back in 1994 and Alan and I talked over it and we came to the conclusion that commodity space isn't a proper vector space because the components of a vector of commodities are separable. You can take one of the components away and then you can recombine them later or you can operate on the components individually and recombine them. At any point, a commodity owner can, can choose to exchange just part of their stock of linen or just part of their stock of tea. Now, this is what I'm calling separable trading and show how the existence of separable trading would lead to a contradiction if commodity space was Euclidean. Start off with 20 units of linen. Move along the line of equidistance to the position where you have 8 of T and 12 of linen. You then sell your remaining 8 of T for linen. Now, if we plot a circle centered on the intersection here and take down this 8 of t, you end up over there. So you end up with 28 yards of linen, which is more than you started off with. So you would get a surplus. You could, if it was the fact that commodity space folds a Euclidean metric, then you could get surplus value generated just by exchange. So merely establishing that exchange is an equivalence relation doesn't prevent the possibility of surplus value arising in exchange. It has not only to be an equivalence relation, but it has to be an equivalence relation founded on a non-Euclidean vector space or non-Euclidean metric space. The actual form of the metric space of value prevents this happening. It treats the isovals or points of equal value or circles in value space as parallel lines as shown to the right here. And it's a property of these that separable trading will not give you any surplus. I can't be bothered to prove it at the moment, but you can work it out yourself. Now, suppose we have an actual vector space, and these really do exist in the world. Um, polarized light is an example of it. There are lots of other ones in quantum systems. Suppose we start out with a horizontally polarized beam of light. All its amplitude, which we'll write, the amplitude is E0. All the amplitude is in the horizontal component of the wave. We can then rotate the plane of polarization by 45 degrees and get another wave, which is of amplitude A, or E0, in the 45 degree direction. 
But this has orthogonal components. It's got a vertical polarization component and a horizontal polarization component. And by simple geometry, the amplitude of each of these is going to be the original amplitude divided by root 2. That's a uh, simple Pythagorean calculation. I'll leave it up to you to, to check. You'll come across this repeatedly in uh, examples of quantum computing, people doing this. How do you actually do it? Well, you use devices called polarization rotators and beam splitters. So we've got a, a source of polarized laser light coming in here. We put it through a polarization rotator to rotate it by, to 45 degrees. We can then separate it out using a polarizing beam splitter into two separate beams, one with the vertical polarization and the other with the horizontal polarization. Standard components, you can buy them off the shelf. Now, could we cheat nature? Could we create surplus light by separable trading? At first sight, it looks as if you could. It looks as if I could do exactly the same steps as I highlighted for the tr separable trading of linen and tea in a, in a Euclidean vector space. We, te we split the light into orthogonal components, as I showed before. I'm showing the um, vertical component in green and the horizontal component in red. I'm not actually saying that you're splitting light by color. I'm saying you're splitting it by polarization. Um, now, at this stage, it's clear that intensity is conserved because the individual intensities are E naught upon root 2. If we, sorry, the individual amplitudes are E naught upon root 2. It's a property of light that the intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. So if we square that, we, cut, we see that it sums to the original intensity. Now we rotate one of the components here back from 45 degrees to the original position so that we now have um, horizontal polarized light, combine them and send them back out. At this point, the apparent amplitude or the amplitude from the, the set of operations appears to be root 2 times the original amplitude. And if you square it, you get twice the intensity. So it appears that by carrying out just the set of operations I said are illegal in commodity space, I could get surplus light. Now, what's wrong with this argument? I've said the energy is proportional to the square of amplitude, and it's a direct... What I've done is a direct analogy with the trading example, but again we get a contradiction. Why won't it work? Well, in this case the paradox arises from assuming you can do a perfect recombination. You can't do that. In reality, a polarizing beam splitter cannot combine two of what are called S-polarized beams from different ports into one output. What would actually happen is that both beams would pass straight through and both beams would come out with an intensity of E naught squared upon 2 and you'd get no surplus energy. Okay, that's just a property of polarized light. But what can we say about this? There's a superficially plausible set of operations which could result in surplus light. But the energy conservation principle prevents the construction of perpetual motion machines. It prevents the construction of machines to extract free enemy, free energy from nothing. People should check um, David Deutsch's recent writing on what is called constructor theory.
which is a very Marxian praxis oriented view of physics, which um, says that you should see physical laws in terms of what they forbid you from doing. In the case of light, the conservation of energy allows light to still be a polarised light, still to be a proper vector space, a proper Euclidean vector space. And that it is a proper ve Euclidean vector space is what Bell's theorem is all about. If you haven't heard of this, it's a very important theorem in quantum mechanics dating from the 60s, I suggest you read, uh, view one of the many videos on Bell's theorem. So what we're saying is that for light, separation, Euclidean rotation and recombination would violate energy conservation. And what is actually allowed is Euclidean rotation and separation but not perfect recombination. So energy conservation is maintained. For value, if you had separation, Euclidean rotation and recombination, you'd have a vi violation of value conservation. Not only would you have a val violation of value conservation, you would apparently be able to produce infinite amounts of linen by just by trading. How, do, how is it resolved in the case of value? By again allowing two of the operations and not the third. Recombination and separation, but not Euclidean rotation. Now there is a further similarity between value space and energy. If we go back to geometry, the amplitude components of the polarized light move along this circle as you rotate the polarization. But the energy components, since they're proportional to the square of the amplitude, move along this straight line. Again, you can check the maths yourself. The point is that the conservation of energy induces a straight line graph. And you'll see the same if you were to plot the movement of a falling body and plot kinetic energy versus potential energy. You'd again get this kind of straight line graph. And you can say, in general, a system governed by a conservation law will show this kind of straight line graph. And a large part of Marx's argument at the start of capital, is to argue that commodity exchange is governed by a conservation law. He even um, invokes old Lucretius to this effect. Uh, Nihil ex nihilo fit, he says. Nothing comes from nothing. Now, uh, nowadays you might invoke a more recent theorist, but he invoked... Lucretius. The generalization of this is that we've said the metric space of commodities has its form as a necessary result of exchange and separability. But this applies to bundles of other assets, not just commodities, things which are not genuinely commodities made by labor. For example, currencies, shares and bonds which are purely legal titles. All of these exchange according to the same metric form. And therefore, they all apparently have a, a conserved property, value. But this is a form given by the properties of exchange. Even though they that bonds and shares don't really have a value. The operation of a market with exchangeability generates the appearance of a value form. 
Now, given this appearance, the problem is that there's an infinity of subspaces which meet this form. All that the value form says is that you've got to have parallel flat hyperplanes in asset space. But the angles that these planes have, the angles of these planes, have n minus 1 degrees of freedom for n asset classes. This is something uh, you'll come across in a slightly different formulation if you read the Ricardian Marxist literature on prices. So, in effect, the value form is a minor constraint. A lot of fuss is made about it, but it's actually a minor constraint. If there are n commodity types, the value form only imposes one degree of constraint, while leaving n minus one degrees of freedom. An infinity raised to the power of n minus one. So it's a very minor constraint. Something else must close these degrees of freedom. And for reproducible commodities, that something else is labour. 